we'll go ahead and get started. I don't know if anybody else will join us. Did you have to ring the bell upstairs? Did what? Did you ring the bell? Did I ring the bell? I don't even know where the bell is. <laughs> we hope they'll come. So, anyway, welcome. Glad you're here. We'll uh, we'll start by singing a hymn number three fifty nine. Three fifty nine. Alas, it did not save you, please. We're going to do verses one, two, and five of hymn number three fifty nine. <clears throat> He's preparing to be betrayed. He's preparing 
for what's about to take place. He's trying to prepare them for what's about to take place. And um, to the point of the lesson is off the mark that or off target that they just don't get it. And, and mm -hmm. they, they are not going to get it for some time. But eventually they will. But he is preparing them for what we saw in this song is that he is going to die. He is going to shed his blood for us. Just as you heard Jesse say this morning. I mean, he mm. talked about it. He talked about it extensively in the sermon this morning. That this was a price paid for us. Jesus is preparing them for that. Now he talks to them a little bit about what's going to happen. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherds and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you and get into Galilee. Peter declared, even if all fall away, I will not. I tell you the truth, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight. Before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will dis will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to he be he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Ah, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing when he came back. He found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. So again, Jesus is, we see that he first tells them that they're all going to fall away. That they are not going to be strong enough to stand beside him. If you recall in the last, in, in, in the lesson a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the disciples taking the cup from him. The cup meaning doing what he was going to be doing. And he said, you can't do that. You, you're not capable of doing it. Well, today he's telling them that you're going to fall away. You're not going to, you're not going to continue through and be able to stand with me. You're not going to be up to the task. And of course, Peter and, and Peter always up front, he says, oh no, not me. I'm not going to do that. Well, we know from the scripture that he does what Jesus says he's going to do, that before the cock crows twice, then he's going to deny Jesus three times. We know that. We know that's going to take place. Jesus tells him he's going to do that, and we know that it does happen. Jesus points them to scripture from Zechariah from the 13th chapter of Zechariah. 
and it talks, it says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. In other words, what Zechariah was doing, if you go back and read into that 13th chapter of Zechariah, you'll find, although it doesn't name Jesus specifically, it is certainly talking about the return of the Messiah, or the coming of the Messiah. It is talking about what is going to take place. It is talking about the fact that the Messiah is going to die. And that's what Zechariah, that's what the prophecy of Zechariah is telling us. But it also says that the sword will be lifted against the shepherd and the shepherd will be struck and that the sheep will be scattered once their shepherd is taken out of the picture. So that's what Jesus is telling them is going to happen here. That he's going to be struck, he's going to have the sword raised against him, he's going to be crucified, and that they're going to be scattered. They're just going to be like a bunch of sheep. They're going to be going in every direction to hide and see if they can get away from the danger. He's telling them that this is what's going to happen. Thoughts, comments? He's preparing them. He's preparing them not only for what's going to take place, but for what they're going to do in response to it. They all had weaknesses that pulled them away. Pulled them away. And we tend to have some of those same ones ourselves. You know, we, we make commitments to Him. We make commitments to do what He would have us to do. And then we get distracted. We get pulled away from things. So it's a challenge for us today, just as it was a challenge for them in their time. And we've got to deal with it. And the only way we have the strength to deal with it is to rely on his strength and to rely on our relationship with him. It's kind of a vicious circle. We rely on our relationship to keep that relationship. Does that make sense? He says that <clears throat> the next thing we see that, that happens is that Jesus takes his what are probably his three most most trusted disciples with him and he goes into the garden and he prays. And this particular passage is you know, it's just so significant because it says so much in a few words. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. One sentence and two different thoughts. Two different significant thoughts in just one simple sentence. We're looking at the human side of Jesus. You know, I don't want to die. I don't want to go through what you're going to put me through. I don't want to face this. But immediately, a split second later, not what I want to do, but what do you want to do? I'm going to do what you would have me to do. So, we're looking at this human being who's going to bleed, who's going to physically die, and yet he says, I don't want to do this, but I will. I mean, we know, Scripture tells us that we're going to be persecuted. It tells us that we will be ridiculed for our faith, that we'll be persecuted, that we'll be that we'll, we'll have people come against us for our faith. But 
we don't have anything, we don't likely face anything like what he faced. We don't face anything like going to a cross and being nailed to it and dying a slow, agonizing death. We don't face that. We may face friends that turn their backs on us. We may face people that don't like what we say and they may argue with us and they may put bad words about us on Facebook or something like that. But most of us, there are people, of course, that do, but most of us will not face the persecution that Jesus faced. They won't face the persecution that the disciples ultimately faced. So, again, we see God in the form of Jesus Christ accepting the burden of our sins on him at first saying I wish I didn't have to do this but then saying I'll do it because if it's your will it's what I'll do the second significant thing about this is that Jesus goes back to his disciples who are with him, the three that are gathered there in the garden with him. And three times he finds them sleeping. Now, he says, he tells them to stay awake. He tells them to be on guard. You remember last week we talked about watching. We talked about being on our guard. He is telling them to be on their guard. Two reasons. One, that he is going to be betrayed. So to be on their guard again for his, for his physical well-being. But also to be on guard for their spiritual well-being. To be on guard for the faith that they possess in him. The confidence that they have in him and to be with him. He is going to going through one of the most difficult, not one of, the most difficult time in his life. It says... In the 33rd verse, he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. He wanted them with him, yes, to keep an eye out for those that were going to come to arrest him and take him away, but he knew that was going to happen. He knew that they were coming. He knew that he was going to turn himself over to them. He could have blinked his eye and they would have all died before they took him and arrested him. But he knew that wasn't going to happen. One of the major things that he wanted these three disciples to do was to be with him, to share with him, to bring him comfort, to spiritually support and bond with him and share in his grief. They just didn't grasp what was going to happen. Do we grasp it? Even though we sing about it, even though we talk about it, even though we read the word about it, it is just something that is challenging for us to grasp. Physically what he did for us but also the willingness to do it, the giving up, the willingness to go to that cross and die. Again, the two points that I think are so important about these particular passages, 
<coughs> Number one, that we're going to fall away. The lesson writer for the teacher's book refers to the Gospel of Luke. And the specific part of that gospel that he references uses another fig tree. You recall last week we talked about the fig tree that Jesus cursed and would not bear fruit. Well, the gospel, the, the lesson that is referred to in Luke is that of a fig tree that does not bear fruit despite the fact that it's been cared for for three years I believe it is it doesn't bear fruit and finally the owner of the orchard says get rid of it it's not doing anything it's using up the grain let's get rid of it let's cut it down and make room for another but a servant says let me try one more time let me do a little bit more let me dig around let me fertilize let me work on it the point that Luke's gospel is making about <clears throat> And how that relates to our lesson today is that we get these second chances. We get these other opportunities. We get another try. Jesus woke these disciples up three times. He gave them two chances to redeem themselves. And they didn't. Peter denied him three times, but yet these disciples also went on to share the gospel. They repented and went on to do the work of the Lord, even though they were scattered. Just like Zechariah said they were going to be, they, got, they scattered after the shepherd was struck, but yet later on they went on to convey the gospel, to share the gospel with the world, with the world. So we get multiple chances, we get multiple opportunities because he forgives us. How amazing is that? That he forgives us of all of our shortcomings. And so many we have. So he shares two things with us that we get a second chance all we have to do is repent all we have to do is call upon his name and he'll stand beside us but then he also tells us that we need to be alert we need to be watchful we need to be prepared for what's ahead of us Comments? Questions? Again, not going to keep you long today because we're going to be back at two and involve ourselves in prayer time together. I hope you'll come back for that. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together. We thank you for the opportunity to share and in the study of your word and your closing prayer for our lesson is God we often miss the mark as your disciples thank you for giving us a second chance in Jesus name we pray Amen thank you all